So my name is Mike Dyer. I'm the curator of maritime history here at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. I'm taking you uh, through the uh, through the Turner Gallery, through uh, Cultures of Whaling exhibit. Um, we're going to talk about a number of features in the in the gallery. We're going to talk about the whale boat. We'll talk about uh, we'll talk about uh, commercial and subsistence whaling. We'll talk about the sperm whale itself. We'll talk about modern whaling. So that it's it's quite a quite a uh, I don't want to say comprehensive, but it really is a long story. <laughs> That's for sure. As far as you know, going from you know 1620 to uh, to 1950 is a pretty long way. But uh, we're standing here uh, in front of this this large you know mural on the wall, which is a copy of a of a, a map that was uh, put together, uh, sort of kind of by accident uh, in a way. Um, the U.S. Navy Hydrographic Office, under under the leadership of of Matthew Fontaine Murray, uh, in the late 1840s and in the early 1850s, uh, undertook ocean research very seriously, and the goal of the research was to determine the the if there were if there were patterns to the winds and currents of the oceans, and if there were patterns to the winds and currents of the oceans, how could they be used to benefit uh, uh, commerce um, and, uh, and other you know, efforts such as you know, the U.S. Navy itself or other, other navies of the world. And so this was a, this was a uh, actual s effort to do science on the part of the U.S. government under the auspices of the U.S. Navy. We're going to talk here about the sperm whale here in a second because it's an important, uh, important creature for us to understand. So America's great adventure uh, with, uh, with, with sperm whaling began in the early part of the 18th century. This was a radical departure from any other kind of whaling that had taken place to this point, and it was wholly, 100%, a commercial hunt. The, the sp sperm whales live in the, in the deep ocean, and are, uh, are tracked uh, by vessels cruising around and cruising around back and forth and back and forth over what are called the grounds, so the whaling grounds. And uh, whaling grounds, uh, sperm whaling grounds could be found dotted all around the North Atlantic into the Gulf of Mexico on the, on the, on the, on the Brazil banks and in the, um, uh, in the, um, in the, in the Pacific Ocean and, and Indian Ocean and places all around the world, but but the, in the North Atlantic, which is where our story really begins, um, sperm whales were encountered. If you imagine, by the 1740s, say, say 1750, we were the better part of a century into the colonial settlement in North America. Shipping was going back and forth across the North Atlantic to Europe and England and France all the time, all the time between the West Indies, between uh, North America, between Europe and back again constantly. These animals were known. Uh, however, it took, uh, it took a kind of an innovation in order to, uh, to begin their hunt and, and that innovation was the uh, was the shipboard triworks, and we are we're we're going to get around to the shipboard triworks here in a little bit, but what that enabled Yankee whalers to do was to travel deep out into the ocean and hunt this animal. Now this this is a this is a deep diving uh, whale. It's uh, it's a toothed whale. It's odontocete. Um, it's the largest of its of its kind, and in its in its nose up here, uh, there is a uh, there's a there's an organ in the nose, and then in that organ is 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 a is a kind of a, uh, a very waxy liquid called spermaceti. That spermaceti can also be found in the blubber of the whale, and sperm whale blubber and spermaceti have have unique properties. That spermaceti can be seen right here in the case, right here in the jar. And, uh, you know, as, as you go through the seasons here in the Whaling Museum, you'll see that this spermaceti gets uh, 
harder and softer and harder and softer and harder and softer. That's the nature of spermaceti. As it cools, it gets hard. As it warms, it, uh, it becomes more liquid. Um, when it's cool, you can uh, put it in a bag, stuff it in a bag, and you can put the bag in a press and under enormous pressure, squeeze the oil out. And if you do that enough, uh, after a while, you're left with a solid block of spermaceti wax which was made into candles. And this, you know, this candle trade began uh, out of Newport, Rhode Island uh, in, uh, in the 1750s, and by where the Newport merchants were buying s sperm oil from, from Nantucket and from uh, Dartmouth um, and processing that, uh, that sperm oil and spermaceti into candles. And so, uh, so we, what we see here are colonial Yankees in small vessels these are sloops, single-masted sloops, two-masted schooners sailing out into the North Atlantic, into the Gulf of Mexico, uh, relatively close to home, um, to, to, hunt the, to hunt the sperm whale for its spermaceti and sperm oil. Uh, those, well, the spermaceti is, 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 is seen here in the case. Um, but you know, other th you know, in the case as well, you can use the art to your advantage as you're as you're discussing the processing of of a sperm whale, uh, because you can see that there's a there's an art here that shows the the case in the nose, the junk in the nose, um, and the case and the junk are the are the part of the nose of the sperm whale that has the that that, that surrounds the liquid spermaceti. But there's spermaceti in the case too, and it needs all to be squeezed out and worked out. And then, the, and then the blubber uh, itself, and you can see the lines in the art and the lines in this model that show how the, how the blubber would have been peeled off the carcass of the animal. Um, and so that's, that's sort of what's going on uh, right here in the case. Some other pieces just because, uh, it, it's just mostly for the convenience of, of the visitor to be able to draw a direct correlation between scrimshaw and sperm whale teeth. So there's the teeth and the jaw of the sperm whale, and here's Scrimshaw. What's Scrimshaw? Scrimshaw is just, uh, it's art that sailors, whalemen, did on shipboard to pass the time. And some of it's very, very fine art indeed. Uh, and uh, we have a fabulous Scrimshaw collection here in the museum, but, uh, but you know, the, w the reason this case is put together the way it is here is simply to draw direct correlations between the, between, uh, the the, the most significant parts of the sperm whale and, and the most significant and commonly understood stories about the sperm whale. So uh, uh, to that point, then, at the very end of the case here is a big lump of, of ambergris, ambergris, some say, um, which is a, uh, it's an impaction in the bowels of a sperm whale. And uh, that impaction, uh, which may be... Um, may be tied to a secretion from the bowels to, to cover up the abrasive qualities of squid beaks. These animals live in the deep ocean and they eat a lot of squid. They eat giant squid and they eat other squid and the squids have hard beaks and those beaks could scrape up the intestines of the animal and sometimes if there is a, uh, if there's a, 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 an abrasion inside, the, 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 this, this concretion will build around the squid beaks. It only matters because it was very, very valuable stuff. Uh, ambergris was uh, found to be a fixative in perfume, and so it had a tremendous value. And it's not wasn't found in every whale, but it was found in some uh, in some whales. So the double-ended uh, whale boat, the Yankee whale boat, was a innovation uh, developed, you know, in the colonial shore fishery where these boats. Were, uh, were, were very lightly built out of, uh, out of white cedar um, with oak, um, uh, with, with the tough parts built out of oak. And so the planking was white cedar and, and these boats were very light and very fast and could be launched very quickly in the surf. This same design then uh, r was refined over the years until what we see here is the very last of its type actually in use. So from the 1720s to 1925, 
Um, what you're, you know, this is the end of the line, evolution-wise, as far as the Yankee whaleboat is concerned. And this is a superb example of, uh, of the type because we know the boat that it was, the, the ship that it was used on. It was the, it was the larboard boat on the schooner John R. Manta uh, in 1925. And it was built, the boat itself was built probably by a Portuguese boat builder in New Bedford. Um, but the photographs on the wall are of this boat in action. Um, and so uh, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a superb thing of its type. So uh, it, would, there, it would house six men. There'd be a, there'd be a harpooner, you know, pulling a, the harpoon oar. There's a bowsman, um, a midship oarsman, a tub oarsman, an after oarsman, and then in the very back, the boat header, who was an officer on shipboard and who was uh, theoretically the most skilled whaleman on board, the second most skilled whaleman on board, of course, would be the harpooner. And so um, these boats w were, uh, were made to, um, to uh, hang uh, on, from davits on the side of the, of the whale ship itself. And when uh, whales were spotted, you know, from the lookouts way up at the top of the mast, you know, like these guys, way, way up at the top, the boats would be lowered, and they would uh, they would then you know chase after chase after their whales, and it's got six oars, um, five oars were pulled by you know a very strong whalemen, um, and the boat itself is is outfitted with a number of harpoons, uh, lances. Uh, which were, you know, lances, uh, lances, you know, you can see it over the painting there. Lance is a tool that's actually used to kill the whale, whereas a harpoon is uh, actually used to fasten uh, to the whale. And this, this particular harpoon has a, has a toggling head. Um, uh, that was a later innovation. Um, most early harpoons were, uh, looked like arrows. Um, but, uh, but later on, these, these toggling harpoons uh, came into general use. So uh, once whales were spotted, the, the boat would be lowered. The six guys pull out there as fast as they can. They try to stick their harpoon into the whale. Say you get the harpoon stuck into the whale successfully. Then you grab your second harpoon and stick that one into the whale too. So you've got two irons into the whale. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, a tub, you know, these tubs have about 1,800 feet of line. Pulling um, out a three-quarter inch whale line uh, as the whale swims away. So it's a, you know, it was a big battle. It was a battle royal, you know, uh, actually trying to, uh, trying to pull the boat up onto the whale so that it can be killed, you know, using the lance. And very often, as we see, you know, in the painting that uh, accidents occurred and these boats could be, uh, could be destroyed. People could get hurt or killed. Um, and it was, so it was, a, it was a pretty dangerous uh, way to earn a living, and that is exactly what it is. It was a way for uh, for men to earn a living and for merchants in the city to uh, earn a great deal of money. Um, the uh, on a successful voyage, um, the the owners could could take you know 25 percent profit um, from a successful voyage, which is a pretty great profit. Um, but this this boat has everything in it that um, that it needs. Um, it has uh, it has the oars. It has a water keg for th fresh water in it. It has a uh, uh, what's called a drogue or a, a drag, so that if the whale pulls out all the line, you can tie this heavy cask to the end of the line, and and it's like trying to swim in a swimming pool with with uh, balloons tied to your back. You get very, very tired very fast. Um, it's got all the line in the tubs. It's got uh, these flags. So if there was successful whaling and more than one whale was encountered, one whale would be killed and the whale boat could chase another whale. You'd just hammer a flag into the carcass of the animal and, and you could see the flag sticking up and, and they could come back and pick up the animal later. So, um, so that's... Uh, that's sort of the a, a really relatively brief overview of the of the Yankee whale boat. These little discs that are cut here in the, what's called a clumsy cleat are, are uh, places where the harpooner could 
could brace his thigh uh, as, as he was getting ready to, to plant that harpoon. Um, harpooners didn't hurl their harpoons. The idea was to try to get that harpoon stuck into the blubber as hard and as fast as it could be, which meant that you wanted that boat to be directly onto the back of the whale as much as possible. And so, uh, so this was a very, very dangerous job, but it, but it also uh, was very, very effective, um, especially when these toggling harpoons came in. Um, you know, w once those harpoons were, were stuck into the whale, uh, it was, uh, it, uh, chances were, were, were better that the animal would be, uh, would be captured and killed. So then what? Well, this gets back to our earlier conversation about the shipboard triworks. So uh, the triworks on shipboard transformed a vessel from simply being a, uh, an ocean-going vessel to being a floating factory. Even if it wasn't a fa floating factory of the 20th century type, it was nonetheless a factory vessel because now what this meant when I'm talking about a triworks, and what, I, what we see here is a model of a shipboard triworks, what that is, is a, is a furnace with iron pots set in the furnace. When a sperm whale has been killed or, a, or a, another a type of whale has been killed and the blubber has been peeled off the whale and chopped into, into, into the, to the right size, uh, that blubber can be thrown into the pots. And because the pots are sitting in a brick furnace wh where a fire was kindled underneath, the pots would heat up. And as they heat up, the blubber inside begins to, to boil. Um, and, and the oil boils out of the blubber. And it just keeps boiling out and boiling out and boiling out. And you just keep pitching more and more blubber into the pots. Um, and, you, and this goes on for hours and hours and hours maybe even days, depending on, on, uh, on how successful your whaling is. And, uh, and that oil then, that boiled out of the blubber, uh, is, um, is ladled out of the pots. The, the, the blubbery bits, the, the bits that were, that were left over, called, they called them fritters, would be, uh, would be removed from the pots with a, with, a, with a fork, right? We got a fork up on the wall, there's two forks right up there, right over, right over the S of culture and the R of cultures there. Those are blubber forks. And, you, and, uh, and those forks could you know, fork that blubber right out, of the, right out of the pots and pitch it right into the fire. And then you can bale the, then you bale the, um, bale the, uh, the oil out uh, and, and bale it right into, uh, right into a copper cooler. And what's interesting about the copper cooler is that you notice that there's a spigot about a third of the way up. The bottom of the cooler is filled with water. The cooler itself is copper, which means that it's going to release heat. And so that hot boiling oil is poured in. It hits the water, floats up to the surface of the water, and it begins to cool down. It has to be cool or cool, pretty cool because it's being stored in wooden casks. Watertight white oak casks, barrels of various sizes. And if the, if the wood on the cask should shrink, and the oil will leak out. And that's not good, that's very, very bad. <coughs> and so the, the oil had to be cool, as cool as it could be, as it's coming out of the, uh, out of the, out of the triworks and going uh, into the casks and into storage. And actually, I misspoke. The blubber forks were actually used to put the blubber into the pots. The strainer, which is on my right over my right shoulder here, that's what was used to remove the the uh, the, the fritters from the oil. So you could get rid of the fritters, and then the it was just it's a strainer, and then the, the liquid would flow out, and you could uh, pitch that uh, pitch that into the into the fire. So. Um, the giant jar of oil here, when the oil is boiled out, uh, it, it comes out pretty clear. After it, after it begins to be cooled and pressed, it changes color. So this is the first winter pressing uh, of, of sperm oil. 
And uh, that's sort of what it looks like. That is actually a very, very fine product. Um, this, uh, this, it's called 45 natural winter sperm oil. So it was, it was naturally cooled. Uh, it, was, uh, it was not uh, bleached or adulterated in any way. It's just the first pressing uh, of, uh, of, the, of sperm oil. And 45 is the temperature at which it begins to, it's, it's what they call its cloud point. So um, below 45, it begins to, um, to change its, its um, 45 degrees. It begins to change its makeup a little bit. Uh, but it's, uh, but that is a, that's exactly the product that, uh, that one would expect to come out of not only the Yankee whale fishery, but the modern whale fishery as well. This product was made uh, in the 1960s um, in, in Salem, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, Americans weren't hunting sperm whales at that point. We were importing the oil that was taken by other nations, but, the, uh, but there was a tremendous market for it. So we're in the last section of the commercial uh, whaling section uh, of the uh, exhibition, and this, is, uh, this really is the, the height of, of uh, humankind's uh, commercial intensity of hunting whales. And this is the modern, the modern whale fishery, and modern whaling really began was actually invented <laughs> literally in the late 1860s uh, by a Norwegian named Sven de Foyn who began chasing whales in the North Atlantic with a steam-powered boat and he had developed a kind of a harpoon cannon uh, that, he was, that he was experimenting with and he eventually by the 1870s actually invented this kind of a harpoon that remained virtually unchanged for the entire history of modern whaling. So Sven Foyn invented a, a harpoon that pivots here, but it has these, um, these uh, barbs. And those barbs sort of pop open uh, once, the, you know, once the harpoon has been fired into, uh, into, a, into, the, into a whale. Now, the, the, the whales that were targeted by the modern whale fishery were largely animals like blue whales, fin whales, um, say whales, minke whales, sperm whales sometimes. Um, and uh, 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 and this, this hunt took place uh, in, uh, in the North Atlantic, uh, in the North Pacific, uh, and also all through the Southern Hemisphere. So all around Antarctica, where, where, the, where the, the Antarctic glaciers were uh, produced enormous food supplies of minuscule uh, ocean life that would feed penguins and seals of all kinds and whales of many many species would flock you know to this would all around the continent of Antarctica and uh, this uh, this hunt uh, became a highly mechanized very very intensive hunt uh, and it developed relatively quickly. So, from the 1870s, right up, you know, these uh, there were there were catcher boats being stationed at shore stations in, in South Georgia. You know, by as early as 1909, um, there were uh, there were shore stations in the islands off Antarctica. And uh, this fishery kind of mirrors the Yankee whale fishery a little bit because the the catcher boat uh, was an independent. Uh, uh, steam-driven or diesel-powered um, killing machine, uh, very similar to the Yankee whaleboat, except that uh, except that the Yankee whaleboat's 30 feet long, and one of these things is, a, is you know is probably a 75 or 100 feet long, and they were in, in association. So a catcher boat could could work in a couple different ways. It could either be uh, in association with a with a shore station like at South Georgia. For instance, there were numerous shore stations, uh, Leith Harbor, Stromness, um, at, at the island of South Georgia, and they could go out of the harbor and they could steam around in the in the in the Southern Ocean and kill whales and bring them back to shore. Or there could be a fleet of these catcher boats that are in association with a floating factory. So uh, this diorama shows uh, the floating factory Bellina. Uh, these are gigantic. Uh, ships you know that can that can uh, 
that can process uh, hundreds and hundreds of whales and, uh, and, and process everything to do with them on shipboard. So they would process them into meat. They would process them into, into oil uh, for edible margarines. Uh, these are edible whales, you know, blue whales, fin whales. They, you can eat these whales. And so, uh, you know, a lot of the products of, of the, this commercial fishery sort of came full circle in a way and actually be, were for human, human consumption. Um, but, but a lot of them weren't. So bone fertilizer, for instance. So even the bones of the animals would be ground up uh, and, uh, and turned into bone meal, turned into fertilizer. And so, you know, the, uh, that's what's going on in, in this corner of the gallery. You see, you know, over the doorway, you see a painting of, a, of an early st um, steam-driven catcher boat. Uh, hunting in, uh, in the fjords of Norway. Um, you see on the right here, you see an enormous floating factory and a, a catcher boat steaming out of, out of Odessa uh, in the Black Sea. Um, this, is a, this is a Russian, Soviet um, uh, industrial whaling. Um, and uh, above that, you see a, a floating factory. There are some important uh, bits here uh, having to do with these harpoons and that is that they were uh, these harpoons didn't just harpoon the animal they had an, an exploding uh, a shell that would screw onto the head of the uh, of the harpoon so you can see how it would screw there's the screws you can see the threads this um, it's called a grenade. It's a fragmentation grenade, and that would be filled with black powder and a, uh, and a, and a fuse mechanism. And uh, these pointy ones were very quickly determined that they weren't very effective because they would bounce off the whale. And so the uh, Norwegians, um, Cornelis Weben fabric, figured out that if you hollow out the tip and put these little corners on it, it'll catch uh, and, uh, and penetrate the blubber, uh, and pe penetrate the, the animal much better and, and, and increase your kill ratio, much the same way that, you know, the toggling harpoon developed in the Yankee whale fishery. You know, all of these technological ideas develop over time. The Japanese did something completely different, and that was they simply had a a hollow tip. So this bomb uh, is just simply up, it's hollow. And that was the, that was the Japanese um, uh, grenade, grenade type. And, uh, and it too was very, very effective. Um, uh, along the wall, you know, one of the most remarkable things, of course, is, is the harpoon that's bent at right angles, which is, uh, you know, one of my, you know, just favorite ideas you know to imagine that that you know this thing weighs uh, 175 pounds um, it's you know it's it's iron and 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 that the fact that it could be bent like that and actually broken gives you some indication of the enormous strains between the catcher boat itself and you know a 90 foot blue whale uh, or you know an 80 foot uh, fin whale these are gigantic animals uh, and it was a titanic battle, uh, and the and the gear really did take the strain. Um, you can see that the that these grenades are have a pattern uh, on them, and that was a shrapnel pattern. So when that grenade blew up, it would blow it would blow steel shrapnel all, all through the all through the animal, hopefully to, to kill it as quickly as possible. Um, today, there's a different kind of an explosion that, explosive that's used. And it, uh, it kills the animals almost instantaneously. So uh, in modern whaling today, there, it's a kind of a penthrate grenade, which we don't have one here, but I'm working on getting one uh, for the collection um, that, uh, that is a far more humane uh, way of, of uh, whaling than, than using um, even, even these, uh, which are very, very powerful, very deadly um, uh, tools of whaling. So there is some modern whaling that goes on today. Uh, there, there's a company in Iceland 
that hunts uh, rourke walls in, in the North Atlantic specifically for the, uh, for the uh, meat market in Japan and in Norway. Uh, the Norwegians, I believe, continue to hunt minke whales um, for, uh, for human consumption, for the meat market, as do, as do Japanese. The Japanese have ceased their, um, their hunt in the Southern Ocean and now hunt uh, only in their own home waters. Um, and so the whale fishery has changed uh, dramatically, largely due to its, its success. Um, the modern whale fishery killed millions of animals to the point where these animals were highly endangered and, and some were thought that they could actually go, go extinct. Fortunately, none have yet to actually go extinct from whaling. Um, the North Atlantic right whale is probably the closest, uh, or the North Pacific. The North Atlantic and the North Pacific right whales are, are probably the most endangered great whales uh, today. Um, the North Atlantic right whale was hunted. Their populations were never very large, and when, and when colonial Americans showed up and began hunting them, uh, what, what few animals there were were, uh, were almost wiped out. There's uh, probably 400 or so left today. Um, and in the North Pacific, they were targeted illegally. So these animals were not supposed to be hunted and the Soviets hunted them um, extensively and didn't report it. And so uh, they were almost entirely wiped out of the North Pacific. Um, the North Pacific right whale fishery was a, was a major target of, of Yankee whaling, especially on the Northwest coast and in the Sea of Akutsk and around Kodiak Island from the 1830s uh, right up right up until the 1870s. And so, um, so these, uh, these populations really did come under a great deal of strain, uh, but they've, they're making a comeback now due to the moratorium uh, on whaling and the fact that uh, there's, a, there's a tremendous political and public opinion, um, uh, anti-whaling movement. <laughs> People really do not like the idea that whales are being hunted. Um, and so that, that started in the, in the early 1960s and it has continued uh, worldwide uh, today. Um, so, you know, those nations that continue to hunt whales, um, they, there's nobody that says they can't hunt whales. Uh, and there's a market for the meat, so they hunt whales and sell the meat. Um, it's just an extremely unpopular thing to do.